Hello and welcome back to the third part of a three-part lecture series over tissue histology. My name is Matthew Belzer and I'm your instructor and if you're in my class I would print out the lecture handout or have it available so you can type or write your notes and we're going to go ahead and get going. So today we're going to focus exclusively on muscle tissue and nervous tissue. As always, I've given you a set of learning objectives. They're very similar for each of the different tissues that we're going over because at the end of the day, I want you to be able to describe the general characteristics. I want you to be able to recognize the specific tissues we go over, and I want you to be able to describe the structure, location, and function of the different tissues. Right? So that's what we're doing all the way across the board with tissue histology, which is covered in chapter four. So when you think about general characteristics shared by all muscle tissue, all muscle tissue is excitable, meaning it can fire electrical signals, and those electrical signals that travel along muscle, meaning that there's a muscles are muscle fibers are kind of like electrical wires on which uh, signals transmit. They're electrically active tissues, and the electrical signal itself is called an action potential. Muscle tissue is contractile, meaning it can shorten and generate force. It's extensible, meaning it has a little bit of ability to stretch, and it's elastic, meaning that not all the force that's generated during a muscle contraction is generated by the tugging of proteins. Sometimes you just have the elastic nature of certain proteins kind of causing the tissue to rebound. So those are characteristics shared by all muscle tissues. Now at the bottom you see voluntary and involuntary. Voluntary means that the muscle you're talking about is under conscious control, and what that's really saying is that that you have these things called higher order brain centers and you can kind of think of higher order brain centers as being brain centers in your cerebrum and specifically your cerebral cortex and muscles that contract in response to messages that originate in your brain travel down to your spinal cord along nerves out to the muscle itself right signals that originate in the conscious centers of your brain that control skeletal muscles are referred to as voluntary movements so voluntary movement just means under conscious control. Involuntary means we can't consciously control it. So if you think about your heart, for example, contracting and relaxing, if I said, hey, Billy, stop your heart, right, for five minutes, you can't do that. You can't just stop your heart because it's not under conscious control. It's not regulated by our, the conscious centers in our brain. And as a consequence of that, we call it involuntary tissue. So... When you think about the three types of muscle tissue we're going over, we have cardiac muscle tissue, which is found in the heart, generates force that ultimately squeezes and pumps blood through the body. We have skeletal muscle tissue, which is found all over the place. This is the type of muscle tissue that facilitates body movements. And we have smooth muscle tissue, which is found lining hollow organs and blood vessels, and it controls the movement of substances through our body. And we're gonna talk about each one of those tissues specifically. So skeletal muscle tissue, you have the macroscopic where we can actually see an entire skeletal muscle and within your body you have over 650 skeletal muscles. You're going to have to know a certain number for this class. I can't remember the exact number from the lab but nowhere near 650 but there are 650 skeletal muscles and skeletal muscle tissue is considered a voluntary tissue because the message to contract skeletal muscle ultimately originates in the brain and we're going to talk about that in great detail when we talk about the muscle muscular system and we draw our focus to skeletal muscles specifically. Now when you break skeletal muscle down it's broken into these bundles of muscle fibers called fascicles and then individual muscle fibers you don't have to worry about all that yet we're just going over the histology of skeletal muscle and when we look at skeletal muscle histology we're looking at the small stuff remember we're looking at the microscop microscopic anatomy so if I show you an image of skeletal muscle tissue and I say identify the tissue indicated by the pointer or shown on the image above or whatever way I ask it, right? Skeletal muscle tissue and we're going to look at that in a moment. If I ask you for anatomical justifications or characteristics specific to skeletal muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue at the cellular level, the individual cells or muscle fibers that make up skeletal muscle tissue are multinucleated. So during embryonic development, cells fuse together to form these long, long cylindrical skeletal muscle fibers, aka skeletal muscle cells, that have multiple nuclei in them. 
So skeletal muscle is multinucleated. It's striated, meaning the way that proteins are arranged in the muscle fiber produces a, a striped appearance, and you're going to see that quite readily when we look at the image in just a moment. It has a lot of mitochondria because skeletal muscle is an energetically dense tissue, meaning it requires a lot of energy to do what it's doing. And it's under voluntary control, meaning the message to contract skeletal muscle comes from higher order brain centers, and we can consciously regulate the activity of skeletal muscle. So when you look at skeletal muscle tissue histologically, these are both longitudinal sections. They're just oriented a little bit differently. So what you are looking at right here is a muscle fiber. What you're looking at right here is a muscle fiber. What you're looking at right here is a muscle fiber. And the nuclei of these muscle fibers tends to get pushed toward the periphery. So we see that each nuclei, or pardon me, each muscle fiber has multiple nuclei, and that's what we mean by multinucleated. You can kind of see it over here on this tissue as well. You see those nuclei push toward the periphery, but each of these muscle fibers has multiple nuclei. The second anatomical characteristic is the stripe pattern. You can see it over here, and you can really see it over here because the tissue staining was a little bit different. That's striated and multinucleated. You give me striated and multinucleated on an exam, I know you're talking about skeletal muscle tissue. Now, within the cell, you find these little sausage-shaped uh, organelles, these little sausage-shaped organelles, as you guys probably are already putting together in mitochondria, and those mitochondria are responsible for producing energy. Now, I'm not going to ever ask you to identify a mitochondria on the skeletal muscle fiber, but that's what those are. And finally, it's under voluntary control, meaning the message to contract skeletal muscle comes from higher order brain centers. So we can regulate the contraction of skeletal muscle in our body movement consciously, and that's important. So we call it a voluntary tissue. Cardiac muscle tissue, on the other hand, is a little bit different. So each cell is uninucleated. You have these short cylindrical cells that branch, right? They're uninucleated, meaning they have one nucleus for the most part. They're striated. They also take on a striped appearance. Cardiac muscle tissue branches, so it can generate contractile force from multiple directions, which is what allows it to squeeze on chambers. And each cardiac muscle cell is connected to its neighbor via what's called an intercalated disc. Intercalated discs are junctions <coughs> that have both desmosomes and gap junctions that allow one, cardiac muscle cells to be connected with, uh, to have a strong connection to one another so they don't rip apart. Those are the desmosomes. And two, the gap junctions allow one cardiac muscle cell to communicate with its neighbor. So intercalated discs are really, really important points of communication. Now we consider cardiac muscle tissue to be an involuntary tissue because we can't consciously control what it's doing. It's going to continue to contract and relax as long as there are energetic reserves. So you can't go, I'm going to stop my heart. If you could, suicide watch would be kind of useless. So you see an image and it says, identify the specific tissue indicated by the pointer. This is cardiac muscle tissue. When you look at cardiac muscle tissue, you see the striations, the stripes. Each one of the cells is uninucleated. And you see these lines here? These lines are intercalated discs. Intercalated discs are unique anatomical features of cardiac muscle tissue. So if I ask you, identify the specific tissue indicated by the pointer, <clears throat> it would be cardiac muscle tissue. If I follow that up with, where would it be found in the body? It would be found in the heart. What does it do? It produces contractile force in order to pump blood through the body. What anatomical characteristics led you to your answer? Well, each of these cells is uninucleated. They kind of branch in a weird way. And one cell is connected to the next cell. So there's the beginning of one cell and the beginning of two other cells because this cell branches, right, by these structures called intercalated discs, which allow one cardiac muscle cell to communicate with its neighbor, which is really important in regulating the rhythms of contraction, right? So you have the electrical rhythms of the heart that trigger contraction, and you want the heart kind of to function in unison. You want those contractions to be coordinated, and the fact that cardiac muscle cells can communicate with one another allows for that coordinated contraction. 
So when you look at cardiac muscle tissue at a higher magnification, here's one cell right here. And at the end of these cells, right, what marks the uh, end of one cell and the beginning of another cell are what are called intercalated discs. That allows this cell to communicate with this cell. Another thing that I want to highlight is these cells branch. So you see these cells branching. That's so cardiac muscle can generate contractile force from multiple directions. You also see the striations or the stripes, which we'll talk about at a later time point. So that's cardiac muscle tissue. When I say involuntary, this is a human heart that's continuing to beat, and even though it's outside of the body. So you know the message to contract this isn't coming from higher order brain centers. The message to contract cardiac muscle tissue is innate or inherent to the heart itself. And because of that, we refer to it as being an involuntary tissue because we don't consciously control whether it speeds up, slows down, or stops. Now, the final type of tissue we're going to go over. Oh, lordy. Forgot something. It's all good. Hey, guys. All good. Hey, guys, I'm not editing that out because I don't have time. So that's what happens when you got to transition all your classes to an online format in a super quick way. Now, the next tissue we're going over is smooth muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue is found all over the place. It's a really important tissue. Regulates the movement of substances through your body, regulates the amount of light that hits the retina. So in your eye, your iris, the colored part of your eye, is actually smooth muscle tissue. It'll constrict in order to reduce the amount of light allowed into the eye and on the retina as a protective mechanism. It'll dilate to increase the amount of light allowed into the retina, and it does that independently of whether you want it to or not, because it's an involuntary tissue, so it's regulated by mechanisms that are not under conscious control. Then lining your blood vessels, things like arteries and veins, you have smooth muscle tissue. When you want to decrease blood flow to an area, that smooth muscle will contract and it will reduce blood flow. When you want to increase blood flow to an area, smooth muscle lining the blood vessel wall will relax and it will allow blood to flow. In the respiratory tract, right, smooth muscle lines are bronchi and are bronchioles. And when you decrease, it can decrease airflow to certain parts of the lungs by contracting or increase airflow to certain parts of the lungs by relaxing. Lining your GI tract, your mouth, your esophagus, the uh, stomach, the small intestines, large intestines, rectum, anus, lined by smooth muscle tissue. So it regulates the movement of food through your body and really plays an important role in digestive processes. Your urinary tract, like the bladder, your, the reproductive tract, all lined by smooth muscle tissue. Now, smooth muscle tissue is an involuntary tissue meaning that we don't consciously control it. <clears throat> the anatomy of smooth muscle is, smooth muscle tissue is different than cardiac and skeletal muscle tissue. It's non-striated, meaning it doesn't have that striped appearance. And it's composed of sheets of what are called spindle-shaped cells. So a spindle is kind of like a rod with an enlargement in the middle. So this is what's called a spindle-shaped cell. And when smooth muscle cells contract, they contract as sheets, and they contract in a different way. They shorten and generate force, but they contract in a slightly different way than skeletal and cardiac muscle. And that allows them to do some unique or have some unique functional characteristics characteristics, notably regulating the movement of substances through the body. So each one of these smooth muscle cells, aka smooth muscle fibers, is very small and they form sheets. And it's those sheets contracting in unison that produce, um, you know, the, the contraction of the entire region of the smooth muscle that can uh, regulate, for example, a bolus of food and move that bolus of food from the throat down into the stomach along the esophagus. So when you look at smooth muscle anatomically, it's often confused with dense regular connective tissue. I'll try to alleviate that confusion by making sure that when I show you dense regular connective tissue, it's super wavy. But you can see these little spindle shaped cells and they form these sheets and that's kind of what smooth muscle looks like. So really, really important tissue. Finally, we have nervous tissue. 
Now, your nervous system is composed of the central nervous system, which consists of your brain and your spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which it consists of your spinal nerves and cranial nerves. And we'll learn all about those when we get into the nervous system section of the class. So those are the organs, but remember, organs are made of tissues and cells. So the cells that you find in places like the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system are neurons. And neurons are capable of firing electrical signals called action potentials. So here we see a neuron with like connective tissue sheets around it for uh, with no connective tissue sheets around it. Here we see connective tissue sheets around it or the cells that surround it forming something called myelination. But that doesn't matter. Neurons are these big cells that have multiple processes, meaning multiple projections coming off the cell body. And what they do is they receive process and send information in the form of electrical signals called action potentials. Myelinated neurons can transmit action potentials much faster than unmyelinated neurons. That's what this particular infographic is getting at. But the general functional role of a neuron is to receive, process, and send information in the form of an electrical signal called an action potential. So neurons are big cells. I mean, you can have a neuron that extends all the way from the bottom of your spinal cord to the tip of your toe. You can have a, a, a meter long cell. Now when you look at neurons we've probably all seen depictions like this and we know they're really important. They're the functional cells within the nervous system. But neurons need a lot of support. They don't function by themselves. So there's another class of cells referred to as neuroglial cells. And these neuroglial cells provide support for neurons. And we're going to elaborate much more when we get into that section about what providing support for neurons really means. So if I show you an image like this and I say, which of the following would correctly identify the tissue um, shown above or whatever it is, shown on the image, whatever it is, identify the tissue indicated by the pointer, or whatever it is. Here we have nervous tissue and the type of slide you're looking at is what's called a neuron cell smear. So these large cells with multiple processes or projections coming out of them are neurons. And neurons are responsible for receiving, processing, and sending information in the form of electrical signals called action potentials. So you have these large dark staining cells here called neurons, but neurons need support. They need an architectural framework. They need metabolic support, et cetera, et cetera. And all these little dots you see here are neuroglial cells. In fact, neuroglial cells outnumber neurons by about 10 to 1. So they're a really important component of nervous tissue. And that's all you need to know for now, guys and gals.